Hey, welcome everybody. I'm Pastor Bart. This is Pastor Sonia. Welcome to the Pavilion Church. We're so glad you all are here on this Memorial Weekend. And uh, this is the first time we've been back in this building in over two months for us. So we're excited to be back. And uh, the Bohannon family, we just greet you and love you. You are probably Sonia and I's most favorite people in the whole wide world. And so we love you guys so much. We're honored that you're here. And uh, we have our restrooms, just a couple of housekeeping. We have restrooms right through these double doors. We have some uh, sections in the back that you can have your children. Just remember, it's open. Uh, we only have drapes in back there. But spread out. Make yourselves at home. We have extra chairs. If you want to spread out a little bit more, just spread yourselves out. Make yourselves at home. And make yourselves welcome. And we are so, so blessed to have you all here today. So I'm just going to read a few of the guidelines in case you are concerned about our ability to gather due to the COVID-19 situation. We are in compliance with Governor Lee's executive orders that states nothing in this executive order mandates the closure of a place of worship, prohibits weddings or funerals as a matter of law. So you are welcome to maintain social distancing by sitting in one of our chairs in the back if you feel more comfortable with that, or on the sides as well as wearing your mask. The families have been seated together by row and are assured not to uh, be in harm's way, but we have a nice big crowd here, so we just plead the blood of Jesus over everybody in this room. So today we've gathered as family <laughs> and friends to celebrate and remember the life of Rachel Bohannon, wife, mother, daughter, sister-in-law, aunt, and cousin. You can't really tell a person's life in just a few minutes, but you can look at the impact of who that person is and what they've done by looking around the room. You are the people who loved her and Craig, and you are here to help us celebrate her because of the impact. So Rachel made a request to, the Craig, to Craig and the family that her memorial be a celebration of life and not of mourning or death. So today we will honor her request by first giving glory to God for his covenant and his promise to remove the sorrow and the sting of death, in Jesus' name. Um, one thing I will say, she has been a very close friend of mine as well. She and I were both pregnant together. She, she with Tally and me with Allie. We were, I guess, a lot alike. <laughs> I liked her name, so I thought I would copy her. <laughs> but we are so, so blessed that you're all here this morning, or this afternoon. Psalm 34 says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. Please join us for this time of worship. I sought the Lord and He answered me and delivered me from every fear those who look on him are radiant they'll never be ashamed they'll never be ashamed this Lord that died and the Lord heard me and saved me from
survived by her husband Craig, whom she married on February 6, 1999, and David Blair, Tally Elizabeth. She's preceded in death by her mom, Sally Dumas of Auburn, Alabama, and survived by her father, Ken Beal. She leaves behind many loving aunts, uncles, nieces, and nests, you know, and a father's daughter. <laughs> Asia Alexandria Brantley. Four grandsons. My, my. <laughs> One of her closest cousins is here to share a memory. So we're gonna, I'm going to ask Tammy to come on up and uh, do that right now. 
Hi, I'm Jamie. Uh, Rachel's mother and my mother were sisters, and Rachel and I grew up together. I wanted to share a few memories uh, from our childhood. Uh, for much of our early childhood, our mothers were single mothers, and, and Rachel and I were only children uh, living in the same area around Alden, Alabama. No, to Solga, Alabama. I'm sure a lot of y'all have heard of that. Uh, <laughs> and having the same friends, it's only natural that, uh, that they would uh, provide a mutual support system for each other, and that Rachel and I would spend a lot of time together. Rachel and I had a lot of fun together. She had a vivid imagination, and we fed off of each other, playing make believe. We were off and off on some wild adventure, from fighting monsters and stormtroopers in the woods, <laughs> or in the graveyard next door, to playing uh, superheroes in our underroofs, or building forts, <laughs> spaceships, or time machines out of random junk. Um, when we were really young, uh, she lived in an old house in Otisolga that we called the Big House. She would tell me about the ghost that lived in the house, coming into her room at night when she was trying to sleep. One of these ghosts uh, she called the woman in red. Uh, I can tell you that I was being quite, I was quite terrified at the prospect of having an encounter with one of these apparitions. Sometimes we'd play school, school and she was usually the teacher and I the student. I remember she had a book about horses and uh, she had me memorize and draw a horse. And, all the body parts, the anatomy of the horse, from the muzzle to the fetlocks. Then there was that one time that Rachel convinced me to let her dress me up as a girl. <laughs> she could be quite persistent, as I'm sure many of you are aware. So she put a dress, makeup, and an ugly brown wig on me. I'm not sure what prompted her to do that. I guess she just wanted to see what I looked like as a girl. Maybe she was just tired of playing with a boy all the time. But when she led me to the mirror, I must say, I beheld quite a hideous sight. She thought it was hilarious, and I, and I couldn't help but be amused myself by her finding it so funny. Uh, most of the time we spent outside, uh, Rachel wasn't afraid to, to get dirty or skin an occasional day. Uh, like her mom, she loved animals, especially horses. And I remember going with her to uh, feed uh, an apple to Reuben, that was her mom's horse, and Todd, her she taught me how to hold the apple with my hand out flat so that I didn't get bitten. And every once in a while, we'd, we'd actually get to take the horses out and saddle them up and, and uh, go for a ride out in the country. And uh, I remember the exhilaration of riding, galloping across the open pasture with a horse beneath you and, and the wind the face. Uh, as we got older and graduated high school, uh, I joined the Navy and kind of moved away. And we didn't see each other nearly as much as we used to. I guess we just got busy, busy with all our own lives. I was so pleased that, that God brought Rachel and Craig together. And that they had such a strong, loving marriage. And brought that she had such a good man in her life. And two beautiful children. But whenever we did get together, um, I always, it always felt comfortable to me, you know, as if we hadn't been apart for so long. Mm -hmm. I guess I always felt at home with Rachel. And, and I look forward to the time when I can be at home with her again. In the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right, we're going to do this again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not used to these kind of mics. Um, in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, Paul said, For I am being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will order to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This describes Rachel to a T. Greg and Rachel in the last several years have definitely had a fight of faith. Mm -hmm. I watched them speak uh, faith, words of hope, even when the doctors gave them a bad report, they ignored it. I mean, they didn't ignore that the symptom was there, but they ignored that it had the right to her. 
She's a fighter. Mm -hmm. and she fought valiantly up to her last breath. On the last day on earth, I watched the Craig and the kids by her be uh, bedside there. And they were all just worshiping, praise the Lord. What a way to go. <laughs> so I raised her arms and worshiped the Lord and peace just flooded over her. Mm -hmm. And then she began to reach out, probably for the angels that were there to get her. Although she left us way too young, we'll miss her, but no one called her back. <clears throat> I tell you, heaven's a wonderful place. After you fought the fight that she's fought, you don't want to go back. <laughs> Second Corinthians 4 16 brings us comfort as we rejoice that as a believer we will see her again. Verse 16 says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For well, the things that are seen are temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. This is no doubt Rachel is a believer. Or I have no doubt she was a believer. and loved the Lord. Jack and I pastored in Dixon. Craig and Rachel were pretty much a vital part of that leadership team. We had a five-year minister's training program. Should have been ten. <laughs> but... Uh, had a five-year commitment for biblical studies, administration, hands-on experience, and one of those requirements for ordination was to work in every year of ministry in the ministry of health. Uh, most of you parents have no idea what people are doing in the back of your kids, but you need to go back there and work with them. <laughs> then you'll appreciate them. <clears throat> Craig and Rachel rolled up their sleeves and worked in every area of that church in Dixon. They handled every job, had a great attitude from cleaning the church to working in the nursery. Actually, had a better attitude than I did most of the time. <laughs> well, the years they were with us, they worked with the youth, the young marrieds, cell groups, and the Sonya even got her to sing on the worship team. What? Which was a miracle. She didn't like to do that. <laughs> then she got involved with the vacation Bible school every year. And then we, they, we ordained them. And they've been ordained for a long time. Paul tells us in, 14, in Romans 14, For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Whether you're going or coming, you're the Lord's. Mm -hmm. That's our faith. For to this end, Christ died and rose. And he lives again. Mm -hmm. That he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. As a woman of faith, Rachel was not afraid to let the love of God shine through to those she loved. I think if she were here with us today, this is what she'd tell us. In happy moments, praise God. In difficult moments, seek God. In quiet moments, trust God. In every moment, thank God. <laughs> thank God. In every moment, thank God. Somewhere in your life, if you're going to have problems, you need to learn to thank God. It's the only way out. Amen. Good night. Looks like we made it through the day. The moon sighs. And I know that we're okay Sleep tight I love to watch you drift away I would come with you But on my knees I'll stay Good night Five little fingers holding mine Take flight your dreams and lullabies There's nothing more that I can do But just fall more in love with you And 
And ask the angel armies to stand by When I leave the room I'm gonna fail you I already have <laughs> Ten thousand times And all I'm trying to be, you'll see. Good night. There will be storms that we come through. In time, we will slay dragons, me and you. I'll always want to hold you tight, keep you safe with all my might. So I will leave Jesus next to you when I leave the room. And you will run ahead as if you know the way. And I will pray more than one should have to pray. There will be words we can't take back. Silences too, and I'll be on my knees. You'll see.
I wanted to thank Tally and Jaden for that beautiful tribute. That was a, a beautiful video of a lifetime of moments. And I'm Jill Chambers. Bohannon is my maiden name. And I am Craig's cousin. And I am here to share with you a few, just a few memories as well. You know, Craig actually was like a brother to me. My sister and I didn't have brothers, so Jeff and Craig, our cousins, were like brothers. And Craig and I have shared many moments together throughout the years. In fact, we were actually a year apart in high school. And I talked this football jockey into being in Greece, the high school musical with me. So we did the hand jive together, and it's a forever memory imprinted upon my heart that I will forever hold over his head. And I think we could still do it to this day if I had called him up here, but I got to that. Um, you know, it was really neat because after we, uh, Craig actually gave his heart to the Lord in the youth group that I went to, and then we moved to Tennessee. The Lord called us to Tennessee in 1997, my mom and my dad and my sister, and we all moved here, and Craig jumped in and moved with us. And so he, he had, we had a moment of movement here in Tennessee, starting the church together, and, and then he met Rachel, and I was like, who the heck is this hot redheaded chick? Like, oh Lord, you know, you guys see blue eyes for days, and they like breathe blue eyes. It's like every picture, I'm like, dear Lord. And so she comes along. I, I got to share the moment in their wedding together. Uh, I actually was in the, the room with them when, when Blair was born. And for those of you that understand and know, I met the dolphin that day when the nurse said, push Rachel. I went behind her and she pushed. And I'm like, oh, there's a dolphin. She had a little dolphin tattoo on the lower back. And I'm like, oh, there's a dolphin. And she's like, oh, yeah, sorry. I'm like, that's okay. Make it flip. Make it flip. Flip her. Flip, flip her. Get that baby out. So I was in the room with, shared that moment with her and I got to, Got to see beautiful talent be born, and, and then, you know what, I also got to share moments with Rachel in the hospital over the last couple of years. But of all the moments that I got to share with Craig, the most impacting moment was on May the 8th. We showed you some images of Rachel in the hospice bed in the middle of the living room. I don't know about you, but I've, I've actually never witnessed someone transition into eternity. And I will be honest with you, I was S. K-E-E-R-E-D, scared. And so I didn't know, you know, I was trying to be that strong, big sister cousin, full of faith, but I was, part of me was really scared. And there was a moment when Rachel began to get really antsy, and Craig just went by her side, he leaned into her, and he just said, go home, baby, go home. And the kids came in, and we put on worship music. In fact, the first song that we sang was one of the songs that we sang together, and my mom and dad happened to be there, and we could see Rachel getting very restless. She was like, it was like a tug of war between this planet and eternity. And you could see her trying to decide which way to go. In fact, on a few nights prior to being with her on that Friday, I had a dream. And I told Craig, I had a dream last night that Rachel was in the middle of a bridge and she was just stuck. And as you're standing in the middle of the bridge, 
She couldn't go back. She knew she couldn't go back, but she was hesitant to go forward. Mm -hmm. And I told Craig, I said, my prayer is that God will give her the courage and the strength to cross the bridge. And that night, in the afternoon, in the midst of worship, we watched her. I watched her. I, I got to witness the moment where she pulled Blair in and gave him a big smackaroo kiss on the lips. <laughs> And then she pulled Craig in and gave him a kiss on the lips. And then Tally leaned in to kiss her mom. And then she took Tally's hand and she put it in Craig's. And I was talking to Craig Saturday morning. And I said, you know, I feel like the Lord was telling me to tell you. Because, you know, a man would think, yes, honey, I'm going to take care of the kids, right? That's what most men would think. But I feel like the Lord said, Tally, take care of your dad. Take care of your dad, Tally. And in that moment, it was amazing. There was this peace that descended on the whole room. And we just began to worship. And I watched her as her eyes shifted. She no longer saw Craig and Tally and Blair. All of a sudden, she reached out for her mom. She said, hi, mom. And she started reaching. And my mom was sitting next to me. And I said, what's happening? And she said, well, God starts pushing the veil back between earth and heaven. And she no longer sees what she's leaving. Now she gets to see what she gets to go to. And on the other side, her family members are waiting for her. And we saw her reach for heaven. We saw her begin to reach. And never again did her eyes see, her, see earth. From thenceforth, her eyes saw heaven. And of course, me, if you know who I am, me being me, I looked up and I saw which song was being played while she was transitioning. And it was, your presence is heaven to me. And in just a moment, I'm going to ask my husband and our lifelong family friend Tim to come up and we're going to play your head presence is heaven to me and it's not because we want you to have a fetal position fall fall apart cry although you might it's because we know that today some of you are in the middle of a bridge and you're stuck and my prayer for you and our prayer for you is that we will create an atmosphere of worship that will give you the courage not to cross into heaven but to cross into that which awaits you on this earth and it won't happen without the presence of the Lord. And so, whatever your religious background, whatever your faith, I just want to encourage you. If you want to stand and worship, please do so. But please do so knowing that this is not our way of manipulating you or causing an emotional manipulation. This is our way of creating an atmosphere for you so that you can understand the peace. The Bible says, how precious in the Lord is the death of his saints. I never understood that. How could it be precious? I witnessed it. I shared that moment. Because it's precious, because we get to return to the Father with his arms open. And it's precious. It's a, re, it's a precious reunion. So if Danny and Tim will join me, we're going to just lead you in. They're going to lead you in worship. And I would just invite you to take a few moments and just center yourself. And hopefully today God will give you the courage to do what you may not have had the courage to do before you walked in here today. Thank you. Thank you. 
my future days to come. Your presence is to me.
Greg, I love you. Blair, tell you guys are so precious. Your family, I had the honor of marrying into your family in 1990. Didn't know it was going to be such a big family. I was an only child. Uh, it was all the Bohannon clan that taught me how to love a crowd. And you were all uh, so precious and so kind, so loving to embrace me and Melody and Christopher, my clan at the time. And then Jill and I's growing clan with uh, Sydney and Zeke and Destiny. I was believing for seven, but I, I settled for five. I almost started to feed the children ministry because it took a lot to go to the grocery store. But, you know, uh, I know there's an enormous amount of emotion in the room. There is at every funeral, depending upon what your relationship was with the family. And uh, I, I feel so much love in this room, but not just love. I, I, as I was walking around the room earlier, I was very keenly aware of hope that I, that I sense in our hearts that we all carry for, for Craig, for Blair, for Tally, as they move forward, because God doesn't change his mind. No matter what happens in this life or what happens in our death, the ones that uh, we who are alive and remaining, he said, we'll be caught up to meet those who have gone before us. And, and we have hope in this life. As long as there's breath in our lungs, we have hope. When I've, and I've had the honor of, of speaking and ministering in many funerals through the years from uh, children to the aged, and it's still the same message every time. It's the same feelings that we feel when we walk in. Why you're overwhelmed with the sense of the brevity of life. It is so fast. Mm -hmm. I was talking with my mother in love just a couple weeks ago on the porch as we gathered for some celebration. It seemed like we had them all the time. <laughs> uh, but I said, Jackie, I said, because uh, I just hit 60, I said, do the decades feel like just like two or three years, like the, the older you get? She said, oh, honey, let me tell you. <laughs> let me know, Jackie. And she told me, she proceeded to tell me, but, but not only the brevity of life comes to screaming to our attention, but also the certainty of death. It's appointed unto man wants to die. It's appointed. It's an appointment. In fact, the moment you start breathing, you're moving toward an appointment. And every one of us have an expiration date on us. We don't know when that expiration date is. I know that uh, Rachel, such a sweet woman, precious to our family, partnered with us in ministry, labored with us at our church for many years, that five years ago she would have never even had an idea that, that she would transition this early in her life. But the promise is that it's, you know, for us that are followers of Christ, we die to live. Without Christ, you live to die. And with Christ, uh, he is our blessed hope. Psalm 39, verse 4, uh, says this, Remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me. The psalmist is saying, God, God remind me. Because we get busy. We get busy in the parade of life, in work family, and we forget. Psalmist even said in, in Psalms 90, he said, teach me to number my days. Well, we don't sit around and think about that. That's not a, con a, a constant thought that I have. Well, how many days do I have left? But it is something that when there is a life-threatening situation or you get a doctor's report or something that, that strikes you, that you go, well, I wonder how many more days do I have left? How many how many days do I have that revive me? That my days are numbered and that my life is fleeing away. That my life is no longer than the width of my hand. An entire lifetime is just a moment to you, oh God. Human existence is but a breath. And that phrase, that, that jumps out to me in this passage of Scripture. Just a breath. Human existence is just a breath. Jill and I and Destiny were at Craig and Rachel's 
the week that, that she passed, the, she made her transition and um, sickness and affliction is brutal. That's why Jesus did what he did. He said, many, many are the afflictions of the rest of God delivers from all of them. And whether it's through an ongoing life or that we move into eternal life, hell always loses and Jesus always wins. But I was watching Rachel uh, in that room and every breath was so labored it was it was shallow it was just extremely shallow and I found myself when she would take a breath I was holding my breath for her because it's like I don't know if there is another one behind that one and um, it's really easy for us to take each breath for granted until we're straining for it hmm. And it reminded me when we left that night, it, it reminded me of, a, I have been all over the world and, and I was quite the adventure seeker in my mission trips and the various things that I've done, but I was a scuba diver and I was one time diving in, in the Dominican Republic. We'd done an ocean dive and we, it was not a good dive that day and we were headed back to the missionary's house and he said, you want to do something really, really cool, really different? I said, sure, I'm, I'm up for it. And he pulled up to the side of a mountain and he said, get your gear, and we're walking in with our tanks, and we walked into the side of this mountain, and I said, why are we carrying tanks into the side of a mountain? And there was this little body of water, maybe not more than 30 feet across. He says, he said, put your gear on. You know, I said, what are we doing? He said, this is, a, this is a really ancient cave in the Dominican. And I said, we don't have any lights. He said, I know the way. And uh, so we, we, we strapped up everything and got a regulator on, and I started going down, and he, it, it went down into this really dark black hole and I was staying as close as I could to him but I knew we had already dove that day half my tank was gone I knew that and he's leading me into this path that I had never been in before and, and uh, it keeps going down and I, and I looked at my depth gauge I could still see it and I could still see uh, my air pressure gauge and I'm going well if he's going this direction it's got to be okay and I and I kept following, kept following, and, I, and it was getting harder and more difficult for him to see, to me to see him. And all of a sudden, it just went, I kept looking back. We were down about 70 feet, 60, 70 feet, and I looked around, and I couldn't see him, and so I rushed, actually, to try and catch up to him. And then I turned around, I was in absolute pitch black, probably 70 feet underwater. And in a cave, of course, it can, you don't know which way is up, which way is down, you don't know where all the caves will lead to, but I just I took off and I did. And I started feeling my way in the cave. And about maybe three, four minutes in, I thought, I really began to think, I don't know how many breaths are left in this tank. And I couldn't even see the cage. And I didn't have a light. And every breath that I took, was really calculated and measured. If you have if you have a tank of air, you just go. This is it. And I've I've taken the last breath off a tank and had a buddy breathe me back up to the top, but I couldn't find my buddy. <laughs> and so I I just started praying. I said, God, I got to see something. And I'll never forget that. That I thought, what if I don't have another breath? And I know that Rachel was, had to be thinking that. What if I don't have another breath? But here's the beauty of, of following Christ is our last breath here is our first breath there. The moment that she transitioned, there was no more struggle in her breathing. Yeah. Yeah. She'll never struggle for another breath. Yeah. As much as you need oxygen to breathe here, you need Jesus to breathe there hmm. and to live there. I kept pressing forward in the darkness and, and all of a sudden I saw a small little light. I mean, just very small. And it's amazing when it's super dark, just the slightest little glimmer of light provides hope. Mm -hmm. And when Joe was just saying a moment ago, there are some that are in transition in this room, some that come to celebrate the life of Rachel. Maybe you're in that season of life, you've transitioned, you're not sure where you are, you're not sure what the next step of life is. Maybe you're not certain about your final breath where that will be, but you can be. I saw that little light, I felt like I was raised in an old school church and I wanted to sing, I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more night. 
But I followed the light and it grew and it grew. And I believe it is the same in our pursuit of Christ. That it may not be super bright at certain dark seasons of your life. But the more you move towards Jesus, he said, if we'll draw near to him, he will draw near to us. Yeah. And that's a great hope that, that we all have. I came up out of the water and it was inside the cave and the guy was there. And, you know, it was amazing once I had made it through it and that I come out of the water celebrating the air that was above water. <laughs> and, and I pray that there's a celebration of every breath that you take today as you leave this celebration of life that you don't take a single breath for granted because can we really measure how many breaths are left in our tank? How many breaths are left? You don't, you don't know. You don't get that measurement. You know, in my pantry, our pantry, every can good that we have has an expiration date on it. And it would be beautiful. It would be wonderful if, if, if at our annual checkup, when it came out so great, well, I've got 20 years left. I've got 30 years left. But those are unreliable for us because we don't know when our expiration date is. James 4.13 says, Listen, those of you who are boasting, today or tomorrow we'll go to another city, spend some time, and go into business and make heaps of profit, but you don't have a clue what tomorrow may bring. For your fleeting life is but a warm breath of air that is visible in the cold only for a moment and then vanishes. Our last breath here is our first breath there. Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life. And I want to I close with prayer today. I want to ask you to just bow your heads for a moment. And if you are in one of those places where, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I did take my last breath today. Where I would spend eternity, you don't have to go out uncertain. No, God's not checking our portfolio. He's not checking our job security. He's not checking anything to determine our destiny in eternity. It's only if we have called on the name of the Lord. It says he's near to those that call on his name. And in the last days, whoever calls on his name, they shall be saved. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to celebrate the life of Rachel today. God, I have the absolute, complete confidence that she is awaiting us. It wasn't a goodbye. It was, I'll see you later. And Father, I thank you that we hold that hope in our heart. That as part of the host of heaven now, she peers over to, to encourage us, to, to shout us along the way. And Father, I thank you that those in this room today that are uncertain, God, today they call on your name. And we just do that. Just say those words quietly. Say, Jesus, I need you. Say these words with me. Jesus, I need you. And I want you in my life. I can't live without you. I put my trust and my hope in you. That heaven is my home. Where I will spend eternity with family and friends that have gone ahead of me. Today, is a day of salvation and new beginnings. God, don't let me ever take another breath for granted. Fill my lungs with your praises. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I tell you to turn around and bless somebody, but just don't touch them or breathe on them. All right? I love you,